Okay. Now, you got to admit, for a six minute video to cover the entirety of World War I, this is a kind of model of condensation. And I have the uh, YouTube uh, URL up on the PowerPoint that I will put up online if you'd like to go over it again. Let me emphasize, you will not be asked to name any of the battles. And I will tell you the one fact about the war that you really will need to know as we go along. But the underlying thesis that you need to keep in mind is that World War I is so destructive that it changes the political and even cultural landscape for the entire, in some ways we can say, the entire first half of the 20th century. And we're going to talk today about how that could be. But first, we're going to go briefly over the causes. The immediate cause you saw mentioned in the video, uh, I think there's a picture of this in the textbook, unless I'm misremembering. Uh, it's not really a Serbian terrorist. It's actually a Bosnian terrorist. We call him a terrorist because he wasn't acting in a legal fashion. A Bosnian kills the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife by shooting them on June 28, 1914 in Sarajevo. And he does this for nationalist reasons because this part of the world, Bosnia, is under the control of Austria-Hungary. That's one cause. That's the immediate cause. But the underlying causes are the subject of unending controversy. The first cause that has been much discussed and which the video was very good on is the alliance system. Can you see that OK? Is that, is that red background like a total nightmare? Can you see it OK? OK, good. The alliance system. The war begins on August, 4th, 19, August 1st, 1914, even though Germany is reluctant to get into a war because it is allied with Austria-Hungary. Because of the system of alliances, which I'll, I'll show you in the, next, in the next point on this outline, uh, it gets into the war because Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia for not having prevented this terrorist attack on the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. It declares war on Serbia because it's going to punish Serbia. Serbia gives in, this is in the textbook, gives in to a variety of demands of Austria except one. And because it will not agree to the last one, Austria declares war, thinking it will quickly defeat Serbia, give it a lesson, bring it back into line, exert its power. Germany has to support Austria because it has an alliance that says, if you go to war against somebody, I go to war with you. And then even worse, because of the alliance system, which I will lay out in the next point, and because of the slow, because of the amount of time it takes to mobilize the troops, there is preemptive mobilization. Russia is allied with Serbia. When, Russia, when Serbia is attacked by Austria, Russia begins to mobilize even without having declared war, just in case there is a war. Germany then feels it must mobilize because Russia has mobilized. And even before war has been declared by all the powers, everyone is ready to fight one. Now, the official name of the alliances, you do not need to remember. The easier designation was given on the video. On the one side is the triple entente. It's just a word in French that means agreement, concord, understanding. The triple entente of Russia, France, and Britain versus what was called then the triple alliance of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. The course of Italian history will be shaped by the fact that Italy changes sides. It begins on the side of Germany and then switches to be on the side of Britain and France, expecting to get something good out of this shift. And fascism in Italy, as we will see, in many ways is a result of Italian disappointment 
with what it gets out of the piece. The video referred, in a way that many books now do, to on the one side the allies, and on the other side the central power. I'm a little nervous about this labeling. It's, first of all, looking backwards from World War II, where we refer to the allies as the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. France is kicked out of the war, of course, very early on. My problem with this is, what does allies mean? Everybody is allies here. On one side, we have the allies of Britain, France, and Russia. And then on the other side, we have the allies of Germany, Turkey, uh, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, because Turkey is also on the side of the Triple Alliance. So it's, I'm afraid, a labeling that's added by those who win. We are the allies who won the war together. But the other side was just as allied as our side was. So I have a little problem with the, it's the central powers versus the allies. You'll be confused by this because books shift back and forth. You just need to know that on one side is Russia, France, and Britain, and on the other side is Germany and Austria, Hungary. It also includes Italy and Turkey, but we can't remember everything. At first, the war was traced by historians to the alliance system. Then, increasingly, after World War II, more attention was paid to whether the Germans had deliberately wanted to have a war to increase their imperial holdings and to have more of a say in international affairs commensurate with their growing industrial strength. There has been much debate about this. It does appear from evidence that was found after World War II that the Germans did have plans for what they would like to accomplish. And some of this belligerence is first traced back to the imperial context. You don't need to remember these. But there's the first and second Moroccan crisis, which involves various of the great powers. In fact, France and Britain were at each other's throats over empire almost up to the very outbreak of the war, when they become allies against Germany. So we shouldn't assume that these two sides were somehow natural sides. Turkey gets involved because it had always been in conflict with Russia. But don't forget that Turkey had originally been defended by France and Britain back in the Crimean War against Russia. So exactly who's on whose side was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. And then another example of what might have been German aims was the dramatic arms buildup of the decade before the outbreak of the war. And this arms buildup was particularly noticeable on the German side. And I'll, I'll show you a slide about that in a minute. And then finally, one of the really strange and horrible paradoxes of the war is that all of the left-wing parties, the socialist parties in France, in Germany, the, those were the important socialist parties, also in Britain, were in principle, declared as opposed to any war. Why was this? Because it would mean that the working class of Germany would be fighting against the working class of France, and thus would go against Marx's insight that the working classes had more in common with each other than they did with their ruling classes. The great tragedy of 1914 is that nationalism overwhelms this position. The leader of the Socialist Party in France was, in fact, assassinated. He was the great opponent of the Socialists supporting the war. Socialists in every country support the national war effort, despite some fears that they would not. They do not oppose war, and they end up fighting each other. And as we, we, as we talked last time about the fin de siècle, there's a kind of general feeling of, oh, we'll have a nice, quick war. It will be purifying in Nietzsche's sense. It will bring forth those masculine, heroic qualities that we've lost with the growth of the city, 
with metropolitanism and cosmopolitanism, we'll get back to our warrior roots and we'll get to start over. OK, on the arms buildup, I've circled it in yellow so that you can see the important points. This is the ratio of British to German warship, that's ocean going vessels, tonnage, 1880 to 1914. In 1880, the British had seven times as much ship power, if you will, as Germany. By 1914, it has two times as much. It's still dominant, but the Germans have gone out of their way to improve their naval position in particular. And many people, there's a, an argument about whether this was a sign of German belligerence or whether it was a reason that the British got really worried about what Germany was up to. And then here, the naval strength of the powers in 1914. This shows you the totals down here. That's not what's so interesting to me. But again, Britain's tonnage, 2 million, German, 1 million. This will be one of the important issues. Overall, 3 million to 1 million, the allies, Germany and France, and, is, and then, of course, once you get the United States, have more ships. As we will see, they have more of just about everything else as well, which explains the outcome of the war. But let's also see defense expenditures. The increase in defense expenditures up to the war. Again, this is the arms buildup. Britain is doubling its its uh, defense expenditures, now this is all forms of defense, Army, Navy, there's not yet an Air Force until the war gets started. I in the period before the war, Britain is doubling its expensive. France is close to doubling. Russia is not increasing. The group as a whole is 50%. Germany is more than doubling its capacity. So is Austria. So is Italy. So they're increasing their capacity much faster than Britain, France, and Russia. So they're very worried at the beginning of the war. OK. We can't go over all the battles. The course of the war, I've tried to do that with the six minute video. What's important to us is, what is this war like? It was not quick. It went on for four years. And in many ways, one of the big questions about the war was, how could the politicians and the generals have allowed the level of carnage that takes place? Now, this will be important because it will set the stage for the 20th century, a century of staggering death and destruction compared to the 19th century. The tragedy of World War I is that no one intends this. So it raises fascinating historical questions about the gap between intention and actual outcome. But we must never lose sight of the staggering level of tragedy that is created in the lives of virtually every family in Europe in this four-year period of time. First, this is because of the development of trench warfare. Actually, there's already a little bit of trench warfare in the Crimean War. It definitely appears in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which shockingly the Russians lose to the Japanese. The first time that the Europeans had been defeated by a non-European power. This, was a, this had enormous implications for what would then happen in Russia. But in general, this form of trench warfare, the development of new arms, the machine gun, which had been started to be used but is now used massively, poison gas, we saw how it is introduced by the Germans partway through the war, staying in trenches and then going over the top en masse towards an enemy that is in a trench that you cannot see, that has machine guns, staggering numbers of men were killed in every day of battle, doing something that was essentially insane. 
and we will talk now later about why people would do it given that it was insane. So the casualties are catastrophic. The numbers of men involved in combat are almost unbelievable. 65.8 million men in arms fighting. Just imagine that as a, as a kind of level of involvement. One in eight of them died. We're not talking about wounded or died. We're talking about died. 6,000 men died every day. 15 million were permanently crippled, were able to keep, be kept alive, but were seriously injured in one way or another. France, as we'll see, I have a whole graph on this. France lost three, more than 3% of the total population and 13% of the men aged 15 to 49. This changed the entire social life of the European countries that lost the most men. There weren't enough men to marry. It created a completely new phenomenon, and one actually byproduct of this was that women became more independent because they weren't going to be able to get married in many instances, and they had to find other lives for themselves. You saw from the video that this war is going on on several fronts, including the Middle East. We are especially interested in the Western and Eastern front, and in fact, we will especially talk about the Western front. Ah, oh, yes, the map of the war. This is not the map of the map quiz this week in sections, but the map of the war. Worth looking at. You are not going to be asked about this, but here's the main thing I want you to get from it. There is great movement on the Eastern Front. The Central Powers, especially Germany, advance quite far into Russia by March of 1918, when the Russians sue for peace after the revolution. The German and Austrian armies have gone quite far into Russia. In contrast, the Western Front really has a very short uh, sort of area that is the subject of fighting. Much of northern France, consequently, and southern Belgium are devastated by the fighting that goes for Four years, there are fruitless battles in which thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of men are killed. Everything is destroyed in the area, and nothing is accomplished militarily. But I will have you note here, and I will say it again and again, the key here is that fighting on the Western Front hardly gets at all into Germany itself. This will be the reason that the Germans will end up feeling that they have been stabbed in the back. Their government sued for peace, and they weren't even losing. That was the myth. Anyway, we will see that that is not true. But the fact that the fighting did not take place in Germany virtually at all shaped the German view of what had happened in the war. In contrast, the French, who were the, which was the place where much of the fighting went on, this would shape their view in a completely opposite way. No one in France wanted ever to go through this experience again. Thus, when Hitler came to power, the French would do anything to avoid having another war. In contrast, the Germans, now we're speaking extremely schematically, would do anything to get revenge for what had happened in the war. OK. This is from a wonderful book that summarizes the research on World War I by Neil Ferguson. He says Neil, not Niall. Neil Ferguson, uh, an Englishman who now teaches at uh, Harvard. He has brought together all, 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 all of the facts. I just, again, we're interested here in the order of magnitude. Just try to imagine nearly 4 million casualties. Now, this is killed, taken prisoner, and wounded. Nearly 4 million casualties in France. 2 million casualties in Italy. 3 million casualties in Britain and the Empire. Six plus million casualties in Russia. And then notice the US gets into the war very late, 
what it does to the US is truly minor in comparison to what happens to the European powers. Similarly, on the other side, nearly 7 million casualties in Germany and Austria, Hungary. The numbers are staggering. Even more staggering is the disparity in who lost what percentage of their mobilized men. This is an extremely interesting point, especially for what it says about the British Empire. One of the things we don't appreciate in the United States is that when we talk about the British fighting a war, as these statistics show, what it means overwhelmingly is the Scots fighting on behalf of Great Britain, or today, the United Kingdom. And this is one reason why there's tension now in Britain about the relationship between Scotland and England as part of the United Kingdom. Because if you look here, you see that, that, there, that, that Scotland, amongst the allies, or the Triple Entente powers, lost by far the largest percentage of total mobilized men. In other words, they were the ones who really died in this conflict for Britain. For, the, for Britain and Ireland, it's 11%, much, 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 much lower. Okay? Similarly, total killed as a percentage of the population, much lower for Britain than for Scotland alone. There are other places where there are huge numbers killed of those mobilized, and especially in Eastern Europe, in Serbia and Romania, and also in Turkey, on the side of Germany. Uh, then finally, total killed as percentage of population, France, extremely high, much higher than Britain, therefore much more reluctant to get into the next war. And you see again, the United States, 0.1% compared to what goes on in France. This is you know, infinitesimal in comparison. Germany, also quite high, 3% of the total population. We're talking about the equivalent in the United States today would be what? Something on the neighborhood of 10 million deaths in the war. This would be, for us, an unimaginable catastrophe. And that is exactly how people thought about it in 1918. So the question is, given the insanity of going over the top on the orders of your officers, the general sitting back behind the lines in no danger whatsoever, even from artillery shells, is sending up the order to the front. Those in the front trenches and those in the trenches right behind them are going to now jump up, climb up the ladders, go over the top, run across fields covered with barbed wire, and wait to be mowed down by machine gun fire. And hopefully, some few will get through to the other side and actually be able to take over the trenches that are a few hundred yards away. And then we will have gained a few hundred yards of territory. Given that, how is it that people continued to fight? Why were there not constant mutinies? Why didn't people just kill their officers and say, basically, forget it. There's no way we're doing this. You do it. Well, there are many answers. First of all, there were mutinies. The video mentions this. In 1917, there was a huge mutiny in the French army, with, which involved at least 20,000 soldiers. Because, of course, in 1914, people thought, well, this was going to work. By 1915, it was clear that it was not such a great strategy. By 1917, it, was, it had reached the level of insanity. You were sent to the front lines. Your chances of dying were unbelievably huge. So there were mutinies. 20,000 French deserted in May of 1917. There were moments when soldiers refused to fight. The famous Christmas tru truces of 1914-1915, faced with the German lines, in one case France, in one case Britain, the armies refused to fight on Christmas and, in fact, came out of the trenches, sat on top of the trenches. It was Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Day, and sang songs that you could, be hear, you could hear a few hundred yards away in the enemy trenches. They came out, too. Those days, they didn't fight. So they knew that there were chances of not fighting. So why did they do it? First of all, the officers were right with the men. The, the number of officers killed was staggering. 
So it wasn't that the sergeant, the lieutenant said to you, the captain of your regiment said, you go over the top, I'll wait here, let me know how it goes. They led the charge. Officers were killed in staggering numbers at the level of sergeant, level, uh, lieutenant, and captain. The generals were not killed, but the lower officers were killed. You did it because you had a relationship to your fellow fighters, your fellow soldiers, a kind of band of brothers phenomenon. You didn't want to be a coward in the eyes of your friends. And in fact, there was enormous worry about whether the troops would fight. There's a great French movie called A Very Long Engagement, which shows all the way soldiers tried to avoid fighting. They shot their feet off. They shot off their hands or their fingers so that they would be wounded and taken back. They did anything they could to have an injury that was major enough to take them out of fighting, but that didn't actually kill them. The French alone conducted more than 3,000 court-martials, condemned 554 soldiers to death, with 49 executions carried out for refusing to obey orders, for deserting your post, for displaying cowardice. So they enforced discipline on soldiers who were not dumb and were deeply dubious about what was happening. So then we get to the question of given all of this, given what I've shown you and I'm about to show you again about the Western Front, about how Germany was really setting the pace of the war, how is it that Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Turkey lost the war after all of this? First was the failure of the Schlieffen Plan, and I will show you it and then come back to my previous slide. The Schlieffen Plan was a German plan, another piece of evidence, by the way, that argued for the fact that Germany wanted a war. It was not reluctantly dragged into it, but may have actually wanted to have this war, is that they had a plan that had been developed before the war about how to win it. It faced the crucial problem that Germany would, of course, also face in World War II, and that was, how could you win if you had to fight on a Western front and an Eastern front at the same time? People, of course, in the military study past wars. And the memory of the Napoleonic defeat was still very strong. Napoleon had been defeated in the end because he could not subdue two powers, Russia and Great Britain. And this was still the issue for continental powers. How could you take on both Great Britain and Russia? In this case, Great Britain allied with France and Russia and hope to win. You would be caught in the middle. Now, Napoleon wasn't caught in the middle. Napoleon was tied down. Napoleon was in Spain and had 250,000 troops there. And then he took 600,000 troops to Russia. His forces were dispersed. Spain is down here. Russia is up there. They're very, very, very far away. Uh, and so that's fighting a war on two very different fronts. When you fight a war on two very different fronts, you have incredible logistical problems. The military has to figure out how to get replacements, bullets, guns, food, everything to two very different locations. And of course, as the map showed you, there's fighting going on in the Balkans, and there's fighting going on in the Middle East as well. But these two major fronts, well, before the war, the German generals had gotten together and developed what was called the Schlieffen Plan after one of the generals who developed it. The Schlieffen Plan was that they would defeat the Allies in the West so quickly, i.e. Britain and France, that they would then be able to fight Russia second. First win in the West, then go to Russia. So they had a plan to defeat the French and the British, they felt, in 42 days, which is actually a pretty short amount of time 
uh, given the logistics of the time. No airplane transport, no use of airplanes until the third year of the war. This is all by railroad transport, which can, of course, be attacked by troops if they get into your vicinity. So this was their plan. Now, this plan hinged on one important fact, because they were also hoping that Britain would not join the war. And Britain would conceivably not have joined the war, except that the German plan required marching through Belgium, which since its foundation in 1830, a fact which I'm sure is just at the top of your minds, through a European agreement, Belgium became separate from the Netherlands. They had been together before that, between 1815 and 1830. Belgium becomes a separate country with the understanding that it will always be neutral. It will not be on anybody's side. It will not be allied with France. It will not be allied with Britain. It will not be allied with Germany. It's in between all three. It will be forever neutral the way, to this day, Switzerland is always neutral. Okay? Does not enter any war on the side of any other European power. Belgium was officially neutral. The German plan, and again, this is, gives evidence to this idea that the Germans, in fact, wanted the war for their own reasons. The German plan depended upon going through Belgium as a surprise, because Belgium had a tiny army, and attacking France from the north before Britain would even have a chance to get involved in a big way. The British declare war when the Germans invade Belgium. So they're not yet mobilized at the time that the Germans are already going as fast as they can to Paris via the north. So you see this, it's going to be, a, the, the plan is to then flank around Paris. They had no interest in taking Paris. The whole idea was to encircle the French army, get it to surrender, get, the Germans didn't want to take over France in World War I. They wanted to defeat France. Uh, they wanted to keep, keep their control of Alsace-Lorraine, which is over here. They wanted to defeat France and get more imperial, more colonial territories, improve their standing in the world, show that they were really the biggest guy on the block in uh, continental Europe. This didn't work. Why did this not work? First of all, the Belgians, despite having no plans for fighting a war, taxi drivers drove soldiers to the front as soon as they could be mobilized. They didn't have much in the way of a means that they could have used railroads, but everything happened all of a sudden. They actually resisted. It turned out to be difficult to get that many troops moving, even when they defeated the Belgians, to move very quickly through northern France. And at the same time, in the east, it turned out the Russians were able to mobilize more quickly than the Germans thought they would, so they had to start diverting troops to the east. Meanwhile, Britain entered the war and started sending over troops to northern France. The British, there was no fighting on British soil during World War I. The fighting is in northern France and Belgium. OK, wait, back. Why they've lost. Failure of the Schlieffen Plan. First big factor. Second big factor that they hadn't counted on, and that actually was very much up in the air, was the entry of the United States in the war in 1917. The United States did not want to be in the war, ended up entering the war because, well, there are a variety of reasons, because of the German sinking of ships going across the Atlantic. The Germans felt they had to do this because British had such superior naval tonnage. They knew supplies were going to be coming from the United States. They wanted to disrupt this. They wanted to create uncertainty. The US enters the war in 1917, and this is a dramatic change. It doesn't happen all at once. You heard this on the video. What happens is the United States starts to mobilize its troops. It is not trivial. There are no airplanes to transport the troops. The troops do not arrive 12 hours later. The troops have to be brought to the eastern seaboard. They have to get on giant 
uh, passenger ships used for this purpose or military ships that were suitable to be used for this purpose. They had to be, you saw it on the video, the first video, they are transported in ships which takes at least seven days to get from New York to England and then they have to take, go from England across the channel to France. So it's not like the Doughboys, as they were called, appeared instantaneously, but it was a whole new reservoir of troops, a whole new reservoir of materiel that could be brought to the front in favor of France and Great Britain. And this is a key element in why the Germans ask for an armistice when they do, because they know that they have just seen the beginning of the American troops and that this will shift the balance against them. And they sue for peace before there is invasion in a big way into German territory. Something that is not talked about enough, the British and the French were not just British and French. The French had Senegalese soldiers. The British had Indian sepoys there, and, and troops, needless to say, from Australia and New Zealand and Canada. The British and the French had huge colonial empires that could provide a whole different source of fighting men, much, much, much more than the Germans who had only one or two colonies in Africa and had been there a much shorter amount of time and were not in a position to mobilize massive numbers of troops from the empire to help them. And then finally, and I'm going to linger on this, the Allies have an unquestionable industrial advantage. Now, Germany is the most industrialized country on the continent. But Britain had been the first country to industrialize. Britain had by far the biggest navy. We saw it was still twice as big as the German navy. And the difference in what the money that could be raised and the things that could be produced, the bullets, the uniforms, the rifles, during the war then, the tanks, the airplanes, the advantage was on the side of the Allies. By 1918, the Allies had 30% superiority in guns, 20% superiority in airplanes, 80 times as many tanks, and five times as many trucks. Having more is crucial to winning a war when you've got such an even balance of military power on the two sides. Now, one of the things that Ferguson has shown, I'm not sure what this is worth knowing, but he has shown that the Germans were more efficient at killing. They killed more soldiers per dollar than the Allies did. They were a very effective military, but in the end, Germany plus Austria-Hungary plus Turkey did not equal the industrial power of Britain, France, Russia, until Russia, Russia withdrew, and then finally the United States. The Russian withdrawal at the end of 1917, beginning of really the beginning of 1918, could have been disastrous for the Allies, but the United States by then had entered the conflict. Okay. So this is the thing I want most to impress upon you because this explains why the Germans have the view of the war that they have. Now, not everybody has this view. So when I say the Germans, I mean that it was easy to convince people in Germany that something conspiratorial had happened. And we'll talk about why that was in a second, something that the video leaves out that's really, really crucial. But I want you to just see, these are the various lines of the furthest German advance in 1914. You see the Germans get all the way here. They had planned to go like this around Paris. They get quite close to Paris in 1914, okay? But as, as the video said, the Battle of the Marne proves decisive and pushes the Germans back just a bit. In 1918, the Germans try a counterattack, one last effort to push before all of the American troops can be mobilized. And again, they get very close to Paris. They are, this is all 
This is the border here between France and Belgium. You can see that they're quite a long ways into France. When, our, when they sue for the armistice, that is when they ask for a truce, November 11th, 1914, I always can remember this date because it's my sister's birthday is November 11th, uh, used to be a holiday, of course, it's, it's, it's now not. Uh, this is the line at the moment that the armistice is declared. I want you to notice, because this is so crucial, notice that the line is not very far into Germany. It has gone, now this is important, and the map is slightly misleading. Alsa, Lorraine and Alsace actually belong to Germany. The Allies have managed to push through Alsace and Lorraine, right? This is not part of France. It shouldn't be on the map as part of France. I have to tell the textbook. Production editor, this is a mistake. Uh, but look how far past Alsace and Lorraine the Allies are going to get at the armistice line. There is no fighting in Germany. Germany has lost virtually nothing besides Alsace and Lorraine in terms of territory. So when peace is declared, the Germans at home think, OK, thank God the war is over. This is a complete disaster. It's been catastrophic. Gazillions of people have been killed. But we didn't lose. We just agreed to stop the killing where it was. We did not lose the war. So that's the really important thing about where the armistice is. OK. So now we talk about the consequences of this war. We do not have time, and if we had more time, we would talk about these individual battles, like the Battle of the Somme, or the two battles of Ypres in, in Belgium, or the Battle of the Marne, or especially the Battle of Verdun. You can go to Verdun in eastern France now and still see a whole World War I memorial where hundreds of thousands of soldiers were killed fighting over a few yards of territory. Everywhere in northern France and some parts of eastern France, but especially northern France, everywhere in northern France there are massive military cemeteries for the British, for the Americans, for the French, for the Germans. The numbers of people who died in each battle, hundreds of thousands per battle, we're talking about battles that were sometimes two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, staggering numbers. I, I wish we had more time to sort of focus on exactly how many men were killed at the Battle of Verdun, for example. It's hundreds of thousands, just one battle. Because this remains imprinted on the minds of Europeans, not just for the next generation, thus causing World War II, but for generations afterward. Any place you go in France today, the biggest memorial in the center of every single town and village is the memorial to those who died in World War I. Similarly with Britain. You go to any college in Cambridge or Oxford, and you will find a plaque with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names of students who were killed in the war. It just had a staggeringly tragic impact on the minds of all the Europeans. But we have to go on to talk about what is the consequence of the end of the war. First big consequence, which we'll be talking about in greater detail on Thursday, Sean Guillory will be talking about in greater detail on Thursday, who is a wonderful expert on the Russian Revolution and Russian history, is the course of Russian history is forever changed. The Tsar gets Russia involved in the war. The Russians were very closely allied to the French in this period. The French held a staggering portion of the national debt of Russia, just as the Chinese hold a staggering proportion of the national debt of the United States today. By the way, our original national debt after the War of Independence was 100% held by the Dutch Republic. So it's not uncommon for countries to be involved in each other's finances. The French, French private investors basically were funding the debt of the czarist government. There was a lot of visiting back and forth. There were very close relations. Russia gets into the war 
as the Russian Empire under the Tsar, with a, a country that's just beginning to industrialize in a big way. It does well at the beginning of the war and then starts to lose the war to the Germans. While this is going on, the Russian Revolution starts, which will set up the model for communist revolution of the 20th century. It will bring to power Lenin, Trotsky, and then Stalin. Fascinating story, but it has an immediate impact on the war. The Russians sue for peace. They withdraw from the war in March of 1918 at a rather crucial moment. The Germans have invaded quite far, and this will change the course of Russia and will also change the course of the war in many respects. Because now, of course, France and Britain are like, who are these people? What is going on in Russia? Can we trust this new government? Will they repudiate the debts that are held, for example, in France and thus destroy the holdings of all the investors who have supported the Russian debt? Second consequence, even before the armistice, and this is so crucial, it is clear in the top political and military circles in Germany that Germany is going to lose the war. Its final offensive in the spring of 1918, which it hopes to, to succeed in before the US can bring over all of its troops, fails. Gets very close to Paris again, back to the 1914 line. We've seen that. It fails, and the Germans, the higher levels of the military and the political world know that Germany will lose the war. There is essentially, in the course of this, a revolution in Germany. And on November 9, 1918, Kaiser William II flees the country, and a republic is declared for the first time in German history. Of course, there's only been a Germany since 1871. It's had a Kaiser, that is, an emperor, since 1871. It's dominated by a land-holding aristocracy that also holds the highest offices in the army. So it's got some similarities to France in 1789, aristocracy and monarchy, are now replaced by the first republic ever. It is the republic that signs the armistice. Everything follows from this. Because then the opponents of the republic, and there are many, there are many who are royalists, there are many who are anti-democratic. Adolf Hitler will be one of them. There are many who do not like the idea of having a republic, and they can blame the peace on the republic. Now, and one, one could say one of the great mistakes made by Britain and France is they are so upset about their losses in the war that they don't understand what they are doing to burden the new republic with the peace they are about to insist upon. Germany is not a devastated enemy as it will be after World War II. Of course, everything that happens as a result of this peace will lead to a completely different situation after World War II. Precisely because this peace is so ambiguous, after World War II, the Allies will insist on the complete obliteration of all German military power. They will not even agree to peace until Berlin has been taken, until every major city in Germany that produces industrial goods has been leveled. In World War I, it's not like that at all. The German army is still very powerful. They're in France at the time of the peace. The Republic agrees to the armistice. They know, the generals know, the political class knows that Germany is going to lose. But in some sense, they have not lost in such an obvious way. They don't lose any more men than the other side loses. They lose a tiny bit fewer in percentages, for example, than the French. The French are the ones who are devastated. This makes it possible to argue by people like Hitler and many others, that Germany has been stabbed in the back by the Republican politicians. They have weakened Germany. They have let this happen. The Allies then 
have a peace conference in 1919. There are a set of treaties, because as we saw, the war has in fact been going on in the Middle East. It's been going on in the Balkans. It's been going on, of course, on the Eastern Front. That's resolved between Germany and Russia separately. It's been going on in France and Belgium. There are many areas in which conflict has taken place, and there are many separate treaties. The one that is the famous one to be remembered is called the Treaty of Versailles. The Germans are forced to sign this peace settlement in Versailles. And that, of course, will lead Hitler to making the French sign their capitulation in 1940 in Versailles to wipe out the memory of what had happened in 1919. So they meet in Versailles, and they impose, it has to be said, incredibly draconian conditions on the Germans. Given the uncertainty about whose fault this was, given the uncertainty about exactly what it meant to win, it was one thing to make the Germans give up Alsace-Lorraine, because after all, they'd taken it from the French in 1870. Therefore, it made sense to give back Alsace-Lorraine to France. It had been taken in conquest. It's now given back. Alsace and Lorraine, as I explained before, some people speak German, some people speak French, and some people speak the various dialects of the region. It's not exactly French. It's not exactly German. If you cross the border still, even today, you would be hard pressed to tell that you have crossed the border. So much are the two areas similar along the Rhine. This is why Strasbourg, the capital of Alsace, was chosen as the place where the European Parliament meets, precisely because it was in that territory that caused World War I, and in some ways caused, helped cause World War II. Now it had to become a symbol of peace. The reason why the European Union headquarters are in Brussels is because Belgium was supposed to always be neutral, and because Belgium suffered so much in both World War I and World War II when it was overrun by German forces, ignoring its neutrality. The area closest to France in Germany, the Rhineland it's called, the area around the Rhine River, just across the French border, was demilitarized. That is, the Germans were not allowed to have any soldiers in the territory closest to France. For many in Germany, this was a tremendous blow to the prestige of the country, being told where they could and could not have their army. Germany lost all of its colonies. Again, not exactly clear how that was related to the outcome of the war, since most of the fighting was not in the colonies, certainly not in Africa, only in the Middle East. It was dictated to about what the size exactly of its army would be. It was told not to have artillery tanks or planes. And most famously, it was required to pay a payment, a reparation, for the damage it had caused. Now, this was not unheard of, it has to be said. The Germans required the French to pay reparations after being defeated in the Franco-Prussian War. So it's not like this was made up for the opportunity of World War I. Still, this stuck in the craw of Germans again who felt, OK, maybe we didn't have devastation in our homeland, but it's not like we didn't lose 3 million men in the war the way the French did. It's not like we didn't lose 3.1% of our total population as the French, OK, the French lost 3.4. We lost 3.1. Not exactly a huge difference. And we have to pay for this. And then finally, they had to sign a treaty which said the war was their fault, that they had caused the war. The famous War Guilt Clause, Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, in which the Germans had to accept guilt and pay for it. Now, the reason this was so important was that the great inflation of the 1920s was, in many ways, deliberately provoked by the German government by the Republic to inflate the value of the money so that they could pay back the reparations at, was, at what was effectively a much lower rate. The money was worthless, so they could say, oh, here you are. 
fine, we have to pay 10,000 marks for an egg. We owe you the equivalent of 100 times that. So our payment to you is worth about 10 eggs. Thank you very much. So the whole inflation issue of the 1920s would be related then to the war guilt clause and the peace settlement. Thanks to Woodrow Wilson, who believed in the self-determination of peoples, the conference was convinced to create newly independent countries out of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now there would be Austria, which is tiny, Hungary, which is large, but there would also be, now for the first time since the 1790s, there would be, well, we'll get that's the next one, Poland, but we have also Yugoslavia, artificially created out of different ethnic groups by the conference. Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic and the Slovakian Republic, because it was two different ethnic groups, and a much, much, much smaller Hungary. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland were made independent nation states. This would also set the stage for World War II because then the first thing that happens in World War II is that Germany and Russia agree, agree to divide up Poland amongst themselves once again, just as they had done under very different regimes in the 1770s and the 1790s. Poland will once again become prey. And of course, the first thing the Russians will do is to get control of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And Finland will be in a f funny relationship uh, during much of the 20th century to Russia and then the Soviet Union. The Ottoman Empire is dissolved. I referred to Turkey somewhat anachronistically. The Ottoman Empire, which stretched from present day Turkey, and indeed from the Balkans originally, all the way across the entirety of the north of Africa, including Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, etc. They had lost much of their North African territories to Britain and France. Now the Ottoman Empire is definitively broken up, and the territories of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, present day Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, are all taken away from the Ottoman Empire and put under the control of Britain and France. They are not directly colonies, but they are under British and French mandates. They basically supervise their government. They do not become independent. They are not seen as ready yet for independence. And the Ottoman Empire now becomes modern day Turkey. And in fact, will then in the 1920s go through a major revolution, which establishes there too a secular republic. But so the entire map of Europe in the Middle East is transformed. And then finally, Italy, which has changed sides does not feel it gets enough from the peace settlement. We saw from the statistics that the Italians, too, lost a large number of men. They thought they were going to get territory from the Austrian Empire, in particular the city of Trieste on the northeast corner. They thought they were going to get territory along the Dalmatian coast from Austria. They felt they did not get enough. And then finally, the, the Versailles Conference sets up a new League of Nations to prevent war in the future. This is the prototype of what would be the United Nations after World War II. The issue with the League of Nations is why it did not work. Three countries explain this reason. Russia was not invited. Germany was not included, because it was bad. And the United States refused to ratify Wilson's decision. The United States Senate refused to ratify Wilson's decision to join it. They wanted to return to a more distant stance vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The League of Nations made its efforts, but it never succeeded in, in sustaining the peace in the way that was hoped. And then truly, finally, because of women's participation in the war effort, women get the right to vote in the United Kingdom. The new Weimar Republic gives women the right to vote as part of its new Republican and Democratic Constitution. And the United States will finally get ratification of women's suffrage in 1920. And one last thing before 
you just all go off. The map that shows all this, the parts of the Ottoman Empire that get taken away, the map that you're going to be tested on this week. Note this green area is given to Poland. It's called the Danzig or the Polish Corridor to give Poland an access to the sea. The Germans are crazed about it. This is the Rhineland that's occupied, and this is Alsace-Lorraine that's given back to France. Good luck. Give your papers to your TAs after class.